Hi, thank you so much for coming to our Open Data Week event here at Two Sigma. Uh, my name is Christine Zhang, and I work on the Two Sigma Data Clinic. Um, so Two Sigma is a technology-driven financial investment company, for those of you um, who hadn't heard of us. Um, at Two Sigma, there are a lot of data scientists and engineers, uh, more than 1,400 employees full-time who are working here, um, on challenging data and technology problems every day. Uh, here at the Data Clinic, our job is to be the data and tech philanthropy unit of the company. We provide an opportunity for Two Sigma's employees to work on volunteer data science and technology-related projects in partnership with nonprofit organizations, government agencies, and other social sector institutions. Um, if you'd like to learn more, feel free to go to our website at twosigma.com slash data clinic. So speaking of data clinic volunteers, here's one. This is Dave. Um, Dave is in the audience today. So hi, Dave. Um, he is a data engineer at Two Sigma, and he participated in an internal hack day for social good that the data clinic hosted last December. At this event, we were working with the Urban Institute, which is a research organization um, based in Washington, D.C., to explore a data set on U.S. public elementary and high schools uh, that they had compiled from a couple of different um, publicly available sources. Um, so that's a lot of data on a lot of schools. There are more than 95,000 public schools nationwide. So Dave, along with Tiffany, a business analyst at Two Sigma, who's also here today, and Chris, and a few other Two Sigma volunteers, um, decided to focus just on New York City schools. Um, and New York City is a great city to focus on. I'm not just saying that because we happen to be in New York right now, and I love New York, and the pizza's great. Um, <laughs> but as many of you know, New York City is great from a data storytelling perspective as well because of the city's open data law, um, which requires city agencies to post their data on New York City's open data portal, leading to events like Open Data Week, which we're here for today. Um, and this is a wonderful resource because at its core, when the city's data is made open, it becomes an invitation for anyone, anywhere, anytime to engage with the city of New York. And after our hack day back in December, we decided to take that invitation to heart. Um, after doing some preliminary analysis about New York City's public schools, we decided to go on this journey through the landscape of open data on school bullying and harassment. Um, in, in particular, and these are serious school safety issues, and they have always been. And it's this journey that we're here to share with you today. And I want to stress that we're talking here as data explorers and storytellers, uh, not just to tell the story of what we found out about school bullying and harassment, but also to tell the story of our journey through the world of open data both the federal open data on schools from data.gov on New York City schools um, and local data from the New York City open data portal. So I'm going to start off by presenting um, a brief overview of the data sets that we used. Um, then my colleague on the data clinic, Rachel Weiss-Riley, will go through our methodology and main findings, and I'll conclude with some of the key things that we've learned. Again, not just about school bullying and harassment, but also about what our experiences engaging with New York City open data was like. And after our presentation, we will, um, we're excited to present a panel discussion and a Q&A as well. So, First of all, let's take a look at the landscape of publicly available data on school bullying and harassment in New York City. So by a show of hands, how many of you here in this room know what all these circles on this slide stand for? Yeah, okay. If somebody raised their hand, I'd be really surprised. So that's what I thought. Yeah, okay. <laughs> well, these may seem like random blobs of text to most of you right now, uh, but each circle is actually a key piece of our journey exploring the open data on school bullying and harassment. And I guarantee you that if you pay close attention by the end of this talk, you'll see not only what each of these circles mean, but also how they connect to each other. So pay attention. We begin our journey with the broadest data set, the federal data um, from the US Department of Education. So this is the 95K plus schools nationwide. Every other school year, the Federal Office for Civil Rights sends a survey called the Civil Rights Data Collection to every public school in the nation, which school administrators are tasked um, with filling out. And as you could imagine, there's hundreds of questions on this survey. Um, 
but three of them relate to bullying and harassment. And the survey asks each school about the number of allegations of harassment or bullying over the course of the school year, the number of students who reported being harassed or bullied, and the number of students who were disciplined for per being perpetrators of uh, harassment or bullying. And all of these are segmented into three civil rights protected categories, racial harassment, sexual or gender-based harassment, and disability-based harassment. Um, for our purposes, we decided to focus just on the allegations of harassment or bullying, rather than students reported or students disciplined. Um, this is because if there's an incident of bullying or harassment that occurs, then the school will report that as one allegation to the Office for Civil Rights, or at least they should. Uh, whereas with students reporting, for instance, you could imagine like multiple students reporting a single incident of bullying or harassment, making that data slightly more confusing to work with since it's not a perfect one-to-one -one mapping. So again, in the federal data, we looked at the number of allegations of harassment or bullying. Uh, you can think of them as incidents reported by school administrators to the Office for Civil Rights. Um, and that's on the data.gov open data portal. Um, and the most recent year available was 2013 to 14 school year, which is exactly what we used. So the next step in our journey brings us to the New York City Open Data Portal. Uh, every year, the local New York City, oops, no, okay. <laughs> the local uh, New York City Department of Education sends a survey to every single public school teacher and every parent, as well as to students uh, in grades six to 12 in New York City. Um, so again, we're using the 2013 to 14 school year since that's the most comparable period uh, to, the, uh, to the federal um, survey. So the goal of the survey, which covers 1,700 plus schools citywide is to ask questions about the learning environment and atmosphere in New York City's public schools. So again, there's lots of questions here and you just saw a few of them, um, but let's take a look at the ones that relate to bullying and harassment. So students are asked two things about bullying and harassment. They're given two statements. The first one is, um, at my school, students harass or bully other students. Then, at my school, students harass or bully each other based on differences. And several differences are outlined, including race, ethnicity, national origin, gender, et cetera. And they're given four answer categories ranging from none of the time to all of the time. Meanwhile, Teachers are also asked two things about bullying and harassment, but these questions, as you can see, are worded slightly differently. They're given the statement, at my school, students are often harassed or bullied in school, and at my school, there are conflicts based on differences. And their answer categories are also different, ranging from strongly disagree to strongly agree. Parents are right in the middle between students and teachers because they're given the exact same question wording as students, but their answer choices are exactly the same as that of teachers. <laughs> and I should say almost exactly the same because they also have a don't know response category on the survey that neither students nor teachers have the option of choosing. So as you can see, the slide is getting kind of complicated and you can imagine that the responses might differ between students, parents, and teachers even within the New York City School Survey. Um, and Rachel later on will go through exactly how we compared these responses in our analyses. Um, just a reminder though, our goal wasn't to look just at the New York City school survey, um, even though that is an extensive exercise in and of itself. Our goal in this exploration of open data was to see whether or not we could bring the federal data uh, where school administrators report allegations of bullying or harassment and the local data where teachers, students, and parents uh, in the city express how much they feel that bullying or harassment is happening uh, to see what we could learn. And like, this sounds pretty simple, right? Because it's just combining two data sets together. No big deal. But um, as so happens with data work, things are often easier said than done. And whenever you're joining two data sets, you need something to join by. For instance, in the New York City School Survey, each school is given a unique ID called the district borough number. It's an alphanumeric code, as you can see here. So for this school, the ACE Academy for Scholars at the Geraldine Ferraro campus, also known as PS290 in Queens, um, that code is 24Q290. So that would be great if um, the ID number for the school were the same in the federal data from the Office for Civil Rights. Then we could just match the schools up by this ID, right? But Schools in the federal data set are given a 12-digit numeric ID called the combo key, which, as you can see, is completely different from the alphanumeric DBN. If you saw these two IDs next to each other, you would have no idea what they were. And even the two school names don't really match up that well. So what do we do, right? This was a bump in our open data journey. <laughs> 
So, yeah, what did we do about this? Well, here's what we didn't do. One super nerdy and complicated thing we maybe could have done was try to find some mathematical solution to the problem by calculating something called the Levenston distance between the two school names, for instance. So that's a numeric expression of the similarity or dissimilarity between two strings. So that might have worked kind of well if we had two schools that were like named similarly across the data sets. Uh, like if a school were written out as PS188, the island school in the New York City School Survey, and PS188, island school, parentheses, the, all caps, in the Office for Civil Rights data. And by the way, this is actually how the two, that school was, um, was listed in those two data sets. But in this case, as I mentioned already, the school name was written completely differently in the federal data. It's written as PS290 instead of the ACE Academy for scholars at the Geraldine Ferraro campus. Clearly, we couldn't match the schools by name, either exactly or approximately. So what did we do if that's what we didn't do? Well, sometimes the best solution isn't the most technologically advanced one. It's one that requires just a little bit more research. And that's exactly what we did. We went on the New York City Open Data Portal, so thank you, New York City Open Data, and found a school directory that listed each school alongside two IDs, an alphanumeric ATS system code and a 12-digit BEDS number. So where does that get us? Well, lo and behold, we found out that the ATS system code was exactly the same as the DBN number in the school survey. And this is the part where I got super excited because, um, you know, the, the BEDS number is a, is a 12 digit number starting with the number three, and so was the federal ID. So we thought, oh, maybe the BEDS number is the same as the federal ID. And that would be really exciting. Alas, they were not the same. <laughs> so we thought, okay, we're back to square one. Uh, it turns out that we weren't back to square one, not exactly anyway, because it just so happens that by connecting the DBN, aka the ATS, to the BEDS number, um, we were actually connecting the local ID to the New York State ID, because BEDS is an ID assigned by the state of New York. And this state ID is actually included in the federal data as the SEASCH. Great. Of course, like, you're trying to like figure out where the point is. Like the federal data here I'm referring to is the common core of data, which is maintained by the National Center for Education Statistics, which issues their own ID number to each school. Again, this is a 12 digit numeric code beginning with the letter three. You see where I'm going here with these IDs, right? So like this is really fascinating. What we really wanted to know though was whether or not this 12 digit NCES number was the same as the combo key in the Office for Civil Rights federal data set, because that's where we wanted to join it to. Now, these two numbers might look like they're the same at first glance, because the last few digits are the same. But if you take a closer look, you'll see that the first few digits are not the same. Sad. However, this is the part where I reveal that the Office for Civil Rights data set contains an additional column, the NCES school ID, which is exactly the same as the ID in the common core of data. Finally, we get a nice green check mark. If you followed all this so far, you might be asking yourself, well, why didn't we just use the NCES school ID in the first place? And the answer is kind of complicated, but basically it's that the NCES school ID are not actually unique IDs in the Office for Civil Rights data set in the sense that multiple schools can actually be assigned the same ID number. But that is a story for another day. <laughs> the point of this story was to show you the journey we went through just to join two data sets. It goes like this. We started with the DBN, B, we, wow, gotta take a deep breath. We started with the DBN number from the NYC DOE, which is also known as the ATS, which is good to know because then we could connect the ATS to the BEDS from the NYC ED, which of course can be connected to the NCES school ID and the CCD, which we were able to link to the CDRC because of course the OCR and NCES are both part of the USED. So there you have it, how all those things are connected to each other. Easy as pie, right? <laughs> so to recap, even to begin starting the, answering the question of how the federal and local data sets relate to each other, we had to go through four different government agencies in order to join these data sets together. And, you know, by the way, this is not a criticism of these agencies, nor is it anything new to any of you in the audience who've worked with government data or, frankly, with, like, any data that has IDs in the past. It's just to say that one school can have many unique school IDs across these agencies. And it requires a lot of effort for those of us who want to come in and explore without too much prior knowledge of these agencies and what they do. And so the multiple IDs issue is true of entities of all sorts and all kinds of data, not just schools or government data. So anyway, we joined the federal and local data sets together, piece of cake, and we did our analysis about school bullying and harassment based on these data sets.
And you'll notice I mentioned federal and local here. I even highlighted them at this, at the ends of this line. Uh, but I didn't really talk about state yet. And there were, in fact, a couple of circles missing from that nice circle image on the previous slide. Here they are. So after we'd finished our analysis, we learned that there were two additional databases on school bullying and harassment collected by the New York State Department of Education. So this is an article by Amy Zimmer, who's one of our panelists today. Um, and it's interesting because we didn't know that the state databases on bullying and harassment existed. But at the same time, when we talked to Amy about joining our panel, she told us that she also didn't know about the Federal Office for Civil Rights data either, which just goes to show that data are recorded in many different places and not everyone is aware of where they are. So for our purposes during this presentation, we will be focusing just on the federal and local data on school bullying and harassment in New York City. But during the panel, we will get to talk about state as well. And now I'm gonna hand it over to Rachel to go more into the methodology and uh, share some of our findings with you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Christine. Is this on? Yeah? Okay, good. Um, so that was uh, quite quite the journey. <laughs> it's not quite over yet. Um, so to begin with our analysis, oops, there we go. So what we're going to do is begin by exploring each data set in isolation before then combining them to take a look at the extent to which the New York City survey agrees with the federal civil rights data. We then will conclude by investigating whether differences in school characteristics may or may not be associated with survey disagreement. So now let's turn our attention to the New York City School Survey. So as Christine mentioned before, the bullying questions that students, parents, and teachers are asked in the New York City School Survey are not exactly the same. But when you think about it, they really aren't that different. The first set of questions asks about the prevalence of bullying or harassment in general, whereas the second set of questions asks about, or focuses, excuse me, on bullying and harassment based on differences. So that's how we decide to categorize the two types of questions in order to make them comparable across the different survey respondents. But our work is not yet done. Students, parents, and teachers also have different answer choices. So how are we gonna standardize these scales? Well, again, there are some similarities. They all go from weaker feelings about bullying and uh, harassment on the left-hand side to more stronger feelings on the right-hand side. And since each group has four answer choices, we can rank these in order from one to four, going from weak to strong feelings by creating this four-point ordinal scale. In order to make the parents' responses comparable to the teachers and students, we did need to exclude the don't knows. Um, and in general, 25% of parents on average say they don't know. Now, since Excuse me. So now let's take a look at the prevalence of these answers. So here we're displaying this percent of respondents selecting each answer value to the survey question about bullying and harassment based on differences. The distribution of responses to the more general bullying question is almost identical and we chose not to show it here. So we notice that the vast majority of teachers say that they disagree in light brown or strongly disagree in dark brown that there are conflicts based on differences. Now, this seems really stark, but we need to keep in mind that this may be due to the wording of the question because teachers are asked about whether or not there are conflicts rather than bullying and harassment outright. On the other hand, looking at the teal side, we see that parents are the most likely to agree that bullying is occurring. So 35% of parents feel that students bully or harass each other based on differences, as compared to only 13% of teachers and 19% of students. Students, meanwhile, fall somewhere in between teachers and parents. So now that we have an ordinal scale that's representing the responses, we can compute a weighted average score for each school. Now for this school, you can see that most students select the answer one or two, so not surprisingly, the average score is 1.73. And we calculate this average school score for each group, oops, we calculate this, the average school score for each respondent group for both of the bullying and harassment questions. So we then want to understand where each school falls with respect to the citywide average. 
So given that we have an average score for each school, we can compute the city-wide average and then calculate a z-score for each school that standardizes the school score, school's score with respect to the city average. So negative z-scores signify that the school score was below average, indicating a weaker perception of bullying, um, whereas a positive z-score indica indicates higher perceived bullying. And again, we do this for students, this is sticky, <laughs> students, parents, and teachers for both of the questions. So now let's take a look at how correlated the Z scores are for different respondent groups and students. So here we have a correlation matrix where the darker blue indicates a higher association. The same question is, of course, perfectly correlated with itself. Not surprisingly, within each response group, the two bullying and harassment questions are strongly correlated as shown by the dark blue squares located on the diagonal. So students are agreeing with students, parents with parents, etc. We also see that students and parent scores tend to be more correlated with each other than do teachers and students as well as teachers and parents. Now we can also map these z-scores based on school location to get a general a sense of the geographic distribution of perceived bullying. Green squares here represent schools where students feel there is less bullying based on differences than on average, and purple squares represent the opposite. So as we can see here, students in mid and, and uh, lower Manhattan appear to feel that bullying and harassment happen less often than their peers in other boroughs. Now if we turn to parents, we can see a similar, although slightly attenuated, spatial pattern in Manhattan, but we also see distinct clusters of purple there they are, in the Bronx and East Brooklyn. That these, but these, um, however, these clusters were not apparent in the student maps. Okay. So these clusters suggest that parents' perceptions of bullying based on differences is above average in the Bronx and East Brooklyn. Lastly, we have the scores for teachers. And while we no longer see that clusters of green appear in Manhattan, we do still see that there are purple areas in the Bronx and East Brooklyn that were also visible, as I said before, for parents. So in general, there does appear to be spatial clustering of bullying and harassment perceptions. But what's really interesting is that these patterns are not at all the same for teachers, students, and parents. So we also chose there it is. So we also decided to look at teacher and student agreement within individual schools. So here we're plotting the difference in scores between teachers and students on the y-axis, where each dot is representing a school. Schools are ranked according to total enrollment along the x-axis. So if there was perfect agreement between teachers and students, we would expect that this orange trend line would be perfectly horizontal. But it's not we do notice that there is a slight trend of disagreement and this changes with school enrollment. So in smaller schools, teachers tend to perceive more bullying and harassment than do students. But in larger schools, this trend is reversed. So this suggests that agreement between survey respondents, in this case teachers and students, may perhaps also depend on different school characteristics. Now we're going to turn to the federal civil rights data. So as a reminder, we focused our analysis on allegations because we believe that they might be more comparable to the New York City survey questions, which is of course an assumption that we will go into later. In addition, when we're referring to, to allegations, we mean either race, sex, or disability-based, as we did not look at allegation types independently. Oops. So here we're showing the number of New York City schools reporting zero one and more than one allegation of bullying and harassment. Sex-based bullying and harassment tends to be the most reported, whereas the disabilities-based is the least. So we found that 75% of schools report zero allegations, which is only slightly lower than the national average of 80%. And for our analysis, we classified allegation counts into a binary variable representing zero allegations and then one or more allegations. 
So then using this classification of zero, whoops, sorry. There we go. Um, so using this binary classification of zero versus one or more, we looked and explored differences in school characteristics. We found that schools with one or more allegation of bullying and harassment have significantly higher school enrollment, which is not exactly unexpected since we did group based on counts. Um, they also had a higher percent of students with disabilities, but a lower percent of English language learners. Now we did look at a whole bunch of other different additional characteristics, but differences were not statistically significant. We also discovered that schools reporting allegations had on average much higher z-scores for the New York City survey, indicating that perceived harassment is generally higher in schools with at least one federal allegation. So this suggests that there is general agreement between the federal and the local data sources. So based on the previous slide, we found that survey agreement on average tends to be in the right direction. Namely, federal allegations are associated with student, teacher, and parent perceptions of bullying. But let's take a closer look at individual level schools. So here we have a graph of schools with zero allegations in the federal data. Each line represents a school, and what we're doing here is plotting the percent of students who say that bullying based on differences happens all the time. So clearly you can see there is wide range of variation in student perceptions for schools with zero federal allegations. For example, this line here highlights one particular school that reports zero allegations of bullying, yet 35% of students say that bullying is happening all the time. Now, we can graph schools with one or more federal allegation as well. We see similar variability in the percent of students perceiving bullying to happen all the time. And we can also pull out another extreme outlier. Here we have a school with 26 allegations of sexual harassment, yet less than 1% of students feel that bullying is happening all the time. So the key takeaway here is that schools exhibit a lot of variation in bullying perceptions, despite what is reported to the Office of Civil Rights. So now let's see if we can try to better characterize what makes a school more or less likely to have or to show disagreement between data sources. So to do this, we first need to define what exactly is agreement and disagreement. And we've conceptualized it like this. For the federal data, we have a binary classification of zero allegations on the left-hand side and one or more allegation on the right. Similar, similarly, for the New York City survey data, we can categorize schools into those with a low perception of bullying on the bottom and those with a high perception on top. Now to do this, we ranked schools using z-scores and used a threshold to define low perception that bucketed roughly the same percent of schools as those with zero allegations. So now we can map schools into zones of agreement as well as zones of disagreement. So agreement here would be defined as schools with zero allegations and low perception of bullying, or at least one allegation and high perception. Conversely, disagreement would be schools with zero allegations and high perception of bullying, or one, allegation, one or more allegation and low perception. So now let's overlay our actual data for each school to demonstrate how we can translate this conceptual framework into an agreement versus disagreement metric that we can then use for analysis. So on the y-axis, we have the number of federal allegations. Schools with zero allegations fall to the left, and on the y-axis, we plot student z-scores. Schools with a low perception of bullying are located on the bottom. Now, each school is categorized into each of these four, one of these four zones. And right here, you can actually see the outlier we discussed earlier. It has 26 allegations and low student perception of bullying. So, not surprisingly, we classify this as disagreement. So, if we pause for a moment here and we look at the data, we can see that over one in three schools have disagreement. But I think even more interesting is the 13% of schools where students report a high perception of bullying, yet there are no federal allegations. And perhaps if we had a lot more time, you know, I'd, I'd be curious to see whether we can investigate the potential for possible underreporting in these schools. 
Okay, so a lot of research has been directed at understanding predictors of school bullying, but our interest today is really to uncover not only the extent to which there is general agreement between different data sources, but also whether certain schools are more likely to exhibit disagreement than others. So now that every school has been assigned either a one for agreement or a zero for disagreement, we can use this variable as a response in a very simple first pass logistic regression model to investigate the relationship between survey agreement or disagreement and various school characteristics. So here's the list of variables we looked at. We have different grade levels, we have different types of schools, as well as a whole bunch of socio-demographic attributes that are all available from the New York City Open Data Portal. We ran three different models for parents, students, and teachers. And with the inclusion of all these, model, all these variables in our models, only those that are remaining here bolded in teal are significantly and positively associated with federal local disagreement. So what are we seeing here? Well, high school parents are three times more likely to disagree with federal reporting as compared to elementary schools. Similarly, high school teachers are eight times more likely to disagree than elementary school teachers. We also found that disagreement for parents and teachers is more likely as the percent of students with disabilities increases in the school. And then among all three of these logistic models, total school enrollment does matter. For your average school, if you were to increase total enrollment by 1,000 students, the likelihood of disagreement between federal and local surveys would increase by a range of 33 to 45%, depending on whether you were looking at parents, students, or teachers. So in summary, we do see that there is discordance in survey measures. And not only that, but it's more likely in high schools, schools with a higher percent of students with disabilities, and larger schools. So now I'll hand it back to Christine to conclude. Thanks. Um, so before we conclude with what we've learned, it's important to note caveats, of which there are many. So of course, the data that we used is by no means perfect. First of all, it's a bit old since we're using the 2013 to 14 school year. And, and we're doing this because that's the most recent federal data that we have access to. Um, and the New York City School Survey in particular has changed a lot since then in terms of the questions that they ask parents, students, and teachers. Um, second, remember that only students in grades 6 to 12 fill out the survey. Um, so the sample size is smaller for students in the New York City School Survey. And thirdly, we made a lot of assumptions here when we compared the data sets, like taking out the parents don't know responses, um, using the four-point numerical scale to quantify answers, doing our whole framework of agreement, disagreement, lots of assumptions here. Uh, with regard to our analysis, there are two New York State databases that I mentioned, which we didn't look at. We only looked at federal and citywide open data. And finally, we are not ex experts in education. And again, um, this is why we are so glad that we're able to present a panel um, discussion during the second half of this event um, with a group of people who have looked at this data or thought about these issues um, in much greater depth than we have here today. Um, all that said, we did learn a few things. Um, and keep in mind that very few cities conduct um, this sort of extensive school survey like New York City does. So it was a unique opportunity for us even to have this data. And unfortunately, I don't think um, anyone from the, uh, New York City's Department of Education is here today, um, but we just wanted to say that we very much appreciate uh, the thoroughness of the New York City school surveys, and it's really a testament to them and to open data in general that we were able to even carry out this exercise. Um, so what did we learn? We learned that teacher responses are less correlated with student and parent responses, and there seems to be the most disparity in the smallest and largest schools. We also learned that on average, there is a relationship between perceptions of school bullying and reports of school bullying in the federal data, um, which is good because that's logically sound. Um, but even though this is the case on average, there are some outliers. The vast majority of school administrators, 75% of schools, report zero allegations of bullying. But there are students and parents and teachers, for that matter, in these schools that believe that bullying 
and harassment is happening all the time or that mostly agree that it's happening. Um, finally, we found that larger schools tend to have more disagreement between the federal and local surveys. But like I said at the very beginning of this presentation, this is also the story of our journey into the world of open data. And we learned a few things there as well. And I hope that you've all learned what all these things stand for too. <laughs> we learned that having a unique school ID might not be enough since there are several different types of unique IDs at the local, state, and federal levels. So like as a thought experiment, as data analysts or data people, let's ask the question, um, what would happen if we, we created a universal school ID? One ID to rule them all. Who thinks this is a good idea? OK, some people do. OK, well, so you know what? I actually have thought about this. And we really think probably something like this would happen, where you have one ID, but then it's just an additional ID, and it's not actually a universal standard. Um, so by showing you all of these IDs, again, we're not trying to criticize any of these agencies because there are reasons why these different IDs exist and they're used differently at the local, federal, and state levels. And we're not really saying that there should be one ID to rule them all since it didn't work in Lord of the Rings and it doesn't work in this comic either. Um, instead, what we are saying is that providing a crosswalk file or a file that links all the IDs together alongside any data set that you provide could really help save analysts and researchers a lot of time. And again, it's not a school's data problem. It's not a government data problem. It's just like a life problem for data analysts. So there we go. <laughs> we also learned that just because data publicly available doesn't mean that it's quote unquote open. We would say that being publicly available is a necessary but not a sufficient condition of being open. One principle of open data, as outlined by the Sunlight Foundation, is having open file formats, for example, rather than propri providing data in proprietary formats like Excel, which is still today the only way that one can access all the data from the NYC school survey. Another principle is timeliness. So as we mentioned several times, we had to use data from 2013 to 14 because the latest federal data hasn't been released yet. Um, and even though the latest NYC school survey is already from 2017, and I believe that the civil rights data collection has already been completed for the 2015 to 16 round, and we're in 2018 now, so that's like a two year delay. Um, one other thing that we haven't yet mentioned is the fact that the original purpose of the different data sets might be different. In other words, there might actually be good reasons why a school in which a lot of students say bullying is happening might report zero allegations of bullying to the civil rights data set. Um, maybe the bullying is discriminatory, or maybe um, it's not along the lines of sex, race, or disability. And we'll get into that during the panel. And finally, and this is one of my favorites, um, we learned that if you're having a problem with open data or maybe just data in general, someone else, um, it's quite likely that someone else has encountered that very same issue and has even solved it. So I went through that crazy diagram um, to show how we had to look up four different government agencies in order to create a crosswalk of IDs, but it turns out that the Research Alliance for NYC Schools based out of NRU has actually done the exact same thing already in their school level master file. So if we had, and this is publicly available, by the way, um, and so if we'd only known about this beforehand, uh, that would have saved us a lot of time and work. Um, and others are also talking about these data. Um, weather pending, fingers crossed, I'm going to a conference tomorrow in Chicago, and one of the sessions is about linking education civil rights data from, guess what, the federal and state databases. And I would bet all of you some money that one of the issues they'll be talking about is how to match up school IDs. So how do we publicize parallel work streams that create undetected public goods like the Research Alliance's school level master file? So we're not all just repeating the same tasks like joining data sets, for example, because that's my particular obsession. <laughs> If open data is the quote unquote central park of data, how do we make it more accessible to the public like Central Park is? Um, and this is the chief technology officer of New York City um, this past weekend. Whose responsibility is it to lower this barrier to entry? So we'll leave you with these questions to think about and hopefully discuss during the panel. Um, but first, we wanted to say thank you so much for listening to our journey through the landscape of New York City open data as seen through the lens on data um, on school bullying and harassment. And a special thanks to Adrian um, from the Mayor's Office for Data Analytics and NYC Open Data Week for giving us the opportunity to share this journey with you today. Self-promo, please go to 2sigma.com slash data clinic to learn more about us here at 
the Zeta Clinic at Two Sigma. And now I am going to turn it over to Ben Wellington, um, who was the original founding members of the Zeta Clinic um, in in 2014 at, uh, for the panel discussion. And again, if you have questions, we'll be saving time for Q&A at the end. Thanks. Come join me up here. Hi, everyone. Thanks for uh, uh, coming out this evening. Uh, my name, as I said, is Ben Wellington. I um, work here at Two Sigma. Uh, have a keen interest in, in open data. Uh, I don't have uh, much in the way of experience uh, studying billing, only, only that I was a computer nerd in high school, so I got some experience. But uh, not academically speaking, and we are absolutely uh, uh, thrilled to have uh, uh, five, our five panelists here today who uh, you know, can take what, what we were doing, which is sort of the, uh, the light look at things and actually uh, uh, get a much deeper look at some of the stuff, right? Uh, a quick look at data, as we all know, can only get you uh, uh, so far without a large degree of context. Uh, and we have a, a, a large degree of context here with us today. So uh, uh, I'm going to uh, welcome our panelists. And to keep things going, we're going to start with some questions. And as you answer a, your first question, um, introduce yourself. Uh, there's there's some bios here, but also uh, you know, let everyone know who you are as as we go. And I'm going to start, and I'll, I'll, this is kind of open, so please, if you feel like you have a good answer, um, we'll start with that. Uh, I I'm actually wondering what's the difference between bullying and harassment, and is is there a difference? I see it interchangeably used quite a bit. I don't know if any of you uh, uh, have given thought to that or have experience with that, and if so, please, uh, anyone. Yeah, uh, so I'm maybe the lawyer on the panel. I don't know. Is anybody else a lawyer? Else a lawyer? So I guess defining terms falls to me. Um, uh, my name is Joanna Miller. I'm the director of advocacy at the ACLU of New York. Um, and one of the big pieces of campaigns that we've worked on for about the last decade is um, to reduce bullying and harassment in schools. So philosophically, any academic you ask is going to have a different idea about what's the difference between bullying and harassment. But from, on a legal basis, oftentimes what you're looking at is the difference in the impact on the person who's being bullied or harassed. So generally with bullying, they're de you're looking for a definition that has some something to do with a hostile environment or some kind of barrier to someone being able to access either employment or the full benefits of an edu a public education, whereas harassment is more often think thought of as like a strict liability. Like there's certain things you just can't do. That's just harassment. Whether or not I felt personally harassed by it, you just can't do certain things in certain environments. So generally that's like an operative definition, but in New York State, State, for example, our Dignity for All Students Act, which is our state anti-bullying law, conflates the terms. It literally says bullying and harassment, and then it defines them both in about a 500-word definition that includes everything, including the impact on the person um, and the actual action by the aggressor. So you really have to look at the source, which is kind of a theme tonight, like what's the intent of the piece of legislation or what's the intent of the policy that you're looking at? How are they the defining survey. those terms, right? Or the survey more than like uh, whether there's sort of a grand definition that covers them all. Thank you. One ring to rule them all, I guess. Is yeah, the... yeah, exactly. Um, and, and you know, we hear a lot about cyberbullying uh, uh, these days, um, though you don't see it explicitly mentioned in many of these things. It, we, is, you know, uh, do we think that's uh, by choice, uh, or is it just sort of a catch-all? Do you think that it should be separated? Um, you know, where, or, or is it because it's outside of the school, thus it's not really a school problem? Anyone want to take so, that? So uh, my name is Megan McCormick. I'm a research associate at MDRC, which is a social policy research firm. And interestingly, I was actually involved in some of the edits that were made to the New York City School Survey between 2012 and 2013. So if you actually compared the older data, you would see what I would call a worse survey. Um, although I should note, this question is terrible because it's double barrels, but um, I think it goes back to the legal kind of definition of bullying and harassment that the DOE wanted to preserve. Um, I see. And now I've actually forgot your original question. Oh, um, I was cyberbullying. Oh, whether yeah. like whether whether it should be explicitly called out, or is it is is there a legal reason why you wouldn't want to, or do you know where where does it fall on the spectrum? Right. So when we were redesigning the survey, one the survey is largely based on the Chicago Public Schools survey, um, which has very similar questions. So another activity might be to combine the New York City and the Chicago responses. Um, there was an idea that there should be a question about cyberbullying, and the 
thought kind of from the DOE perspective was that that is something that's happening outside of schools. At the time that the 2013-2014 survey was actually implemented, it was used for school account accountability purposes. So um, a part of the school grade was the was the combination of the responses in the school survey. And so there was also that accountability component, and schools would largely have been resistant to including something about cyberbullying in an accountability context. Yeah, that and so that's sense. why that didn't get included. But I think it, it's a really good point, and it would be so a do valid we, question. Do we risk, do we risk uh, uh, you know, things that people are afraid of accountability falling between the cracks in data collection because you've got four agencies, it's not my problem, it's not my problem, it's not my and then all of a sudden nobody, nobody's tracking it. Um, you know, I, I could see why a school wouldn't want that on their score. Like, mm -hmm. hey, this is not my problem. But do we? But do we, as a society, you know, how should we think bigger about that? I don't know. So, I'll just jump in here Please. for a second. My name's Julia Bloom Weltman. I am uh, the research and evaluation director at AEM Corporation, and we uh, run the civil rights data collection uh, of the U.S. Department of Education. Well, that's relevant. It is relevant. <laughs> um, I will say that I am not speaking on behalf of the U.S. Department of Education here, but I have some information that I think would be useful. Um, in terms of the, uh, in terms of looking at sort of the national picture of cyberbullying, I do know that the National Center for Education Statistics is interested and does run a survey on that. Um, it's not a part of the civil rights data collection because the civil rights data collection is really focused on. Um, enforcing our civil rights laws. And so that's why the questions uh, on allegations are based on the basis of, you know, uh, they all have statutory requirements um, in the civil rights laws. All right, thanks for that. Um, can, I, can I interject? Yeah, please. You? I'm Amy Zimmer. Everyone can interject at any time. It's a conversation, not a, not a, yeah, so please. And I'm the journalist on the panel. I, uh, right now I work for a startup called Localize.City, which is in beta, and I wrote the DNA Info article in 2015 looking at the state and the state data. And I think all these questions are interesting when you think about the perspective of the school administrators and teachers, right? We are debating where do these incidents fall under which categories. So think about it from a teacher's perspective. I've talked to a lot of educators, and they don't know. You know, they might not know the difference between what's bullying, what's harassment. So when they are logging the incidents, I think there are a lot of questions that they might have and don't necessarily have the support to figure out what, how they should even categorize the incidents. And when I was writing my article in 2015, I, I did talk to a school that had a high number of bullying reported incidents and the principal said most of the incidents that they were reporting were cyberbullying. And she said it had such an impact in the classroom, though, because even though these things were happening off school grounds, they affected the classroom. The children were sitting next to each other in school. And so she felt it was her obligation and her duty to report them as being part of, of the school culture. So she did. But I mean, I think that just shows you there's so much kind of individual judgment calls right. that are made when logging the incident. Right. And, and an individual, uh, I assume a, a, a principal or an administrator might have a different uh, threshold is what is what is bullying on a difference. And maybe you see the outlier, it's somebody who's very, who says ev everything that's happening between two different people, I'm going to call that some sort of bullying. Maybe someone else doesn't, and then you end up with these really large biases in the data set, right? And I guess it's probably very difficult for an observer to See some sort of bullying happen, and then I, I, maybe there's maybe there's a, uh, there are rules, I'm sure, standards and things like that. But to distinct to distinguish, you know, is this because this person is, has some sort of protected difference or not? You know, maybe if it's not explicitly said, there's something that's referred to. So I imagine there's like a lot of a lot of gray gray area there, right? That leads to these differences. There is both. There are both problems with how the individual reporters define what's going on. Um, there's also huge disincentives to report accurate information here. So not only when you're looking at the school survey, for example, the pe it's not required to be filled out by anyone, teacher, student, parent. So the, the percentages are quite low. And the people who are going to fill out any survey, like anything, are the ones that have strong feelings, either positive or negative, right? Very unlikely that someone fills out a survey and feels super neutral about everything. So it's been hard to get really reliable survey data. They, the DOE has done a lot to improve that. But 
um, it's still really challenging. And then with teachers and pa teachers and principals who are logging this information, there are certain databases where they have to log their disciplinary responses to incidents. So they have to go on and say if they're suspending a kid or something like that. We, we learned we learned about corporal punishment and that <laughs> nationally during during this hack day that it was actually you know in the in certain areas of the country still very yes, active. Yes, so that, that was another learning experience from the hack day, which was a surprise to us. <laughs> so they ha they're sort of. Look, doing a look back, right? We had to suspend this kid, and now we have to do this report to suspend them. But so why were we suspending them? And doing kind of a look back there in order to put that, da that data in. But then there's something like the state database, which is actually used to punish schools huh. yeah. if they have too many incidents. Or often, teachers and principals believe it's going to be used to punish them, even when it's explicitly not. And sometimes it is, and sometimes it's not. Um, and so they are completely disincentivized to report accurately. In addition, on the surveys, they're often disincentivized because the surveys have been a mixed use. As you said, they have been used for accountability sometimes, read punishment, and they have been used not for accountability other times. So from time to time, you might be feeling like, I really want to defend my school and protect my school, um, so I'm not reporting anything. I mean, there's no no incentive to accurately report anything that's going on in your school. And there might be times when you're really close to uh, to being on one of these what they call a persistently dangerous list, which can come with additional money, where you want to just nudge it over and put some extra things on there. Dangerous. So it can go either way, really. I mean, there, so there's not only like a definitional problem, but there's also a motivational problem. Like, what is the motivation of filling out any of these surveys if you're a teacher um, or a principal? And if you're a student, what is the story that you're trying to tell by filling out a survey? It's completely different. So it is really hard to get, like, what's a true story? And I will say, one of the things I was thinking about when you were presenting is there is no school with zero incidents. Any school that says there's zero bullying incidents is lying through their teeth. And what they're saying is we dealt with it, or they're saying they're not serious, or they're just putting zero because they're not paying attention. And I think as you see that correlation with the bigger schools where there's a higher disagreement, it makes perfect sense to me from like what's actually going on in a huge school of 2,000 kids and how very unlikely it is that any of those allegations are being taken seriously in a really, really big school. Um, and, and I'm going to switch it over a little bit to the, to the data front because we haven't heard from, from, from Jasmine yet. But, um, I'm going to say something. Oh, please. Well, let's, let's yeah. So I'm Jasmine Zlatani. I'm the data manager at the Research Alliance for, City, for New York City Schools, the organization that releases the school level master file that was presented at the end. At the end. Hey, <laughs> the hero. <laughs> if only it was at the beginning. But anyway. Um, and I know as part of the process of improving the New York City School Survey, we were actually talking to students as well. And I think they do care where and when. Um, bullying and harassment are happening. So I don't know that that means that anything that students perceive as being useful would be, get added to the survey. And I'm sure there are a lot of reasons why that wouldn't be true. But I think from their perspective, it matters. Yeah, so it's interesting to get the, you know, whereas in the federal data, we're not getting any student perspective. Um, obviously, that's a it's, a it's a very different, at least in the surveying, you're going directly to these students. And so they have kind of their voice heard. And so it, it does they're probably not so worried about whether the school is going to have one more thing to put it over the head. So maybe maybe the student view is a is a less biased view based on that, right? Mm -hmm. um, so speaking of this master file, now I'm gonna I'm gonna, I'm gonna swap over a little bit that way because uh, I mean this is an interesting problem, uh, and I'm wondering your it, through all of your experiences. Uh, I know I've struggled with this, but who wh where you know wh how should we think about doing these types of joins? Where should this live? Who should own it? Right? There's there's fascinating questions. For example, um, I remember a, a conversation I had with the Taxi and Limousine Commission in New York City, where there's all this bad data getting uploaded from taxi trips. Um, and in theory, who, sh who should clean that, right? Well, how do how do taxis go backwards in time when they drop off people, right? It seems odd, um, but they're in there. And when I when I mentioned you should clean it, they said, "Oh, we can't we can't touch that data. That would be manipulating data. It's from a vendor, and as soon as we clean it." We're actually uh, uh, manipulating it, and thus that could be seen as bad. So the reason I bring that up is because um, there's this interesting question of as we clean things, as we find errors, as we we, we add columns, where, whose responsibility is this? Uh, uh, where where should it live? What are some best practices that you all have seen um, where 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 in, where people can kind of go and, and find something where maybe on a city website it's it's narrow, but are, are there places that you go where you see a lot, a lot more broader view, and wh what should those places look like? I don't know. Kind of a big open save the world question, but uh, anyone have any thoughts? 
Well, I'll say from not the perspective of a data expert, Please. but from okay. the perspective of someone who writes a lot of the policies that lead to these things, that's why none here. of these were written to be open data sets. And that's, I think, why you're seeing some of the flaws here. Like, none of these were intended to be used by parents or really anyone in the community trying to figure out what's going on with schools. They were intended to enforce federal civil rights laws, or they were intended to um, give or take away money from schools, or they were intended for various different purposes. I think the closest we get to something that is intended as a public use thing is actually the survey. So I, I would think that maybe in the analysis of that data, you're actually getting maybe a little closer to something that parents could say, ooh, this school gets really low marks on the survey. Maybe I want to shop around for another school or something like that. So I'll just, um, to get to the point about linking the data sets, I'm kind of from this idea that everyone should just have an individual ID and every single thing should be linked to them across all time. So maybe take what I say with a grain of salt. But I think that um, New York City has done a good job at identifying what could be some um, identifiers that can link not just schools, but also potentially students to schools. So one limitation of this data set that I think is huge is that everything's aggregated to the school level. So basically, the vast majority of the variation that we see in responses to the survey is within the school, not between the school. So you're kind of getting rid of a lot of the interesting variation that would help you actually predict outcomes based on that aggregation process. And what you can potentially do as a next step, not necessarily in a day, but if this was something you were interested in pursuing, is to access individual level data that's de-identified um, that can actually help you understand how individual students might be reporting on individual items. And that's how you could get rid of some of that weird noise that you're seeing from the aggregation process. Um, I would also say in some other states that maybe have more liberal open data laws, like um, I actually don't know whether they have opened uh, more liberal laws, but in Massachusetts, you can put um, requests into the state and actually access information across time, across agency, and across different types of different school districts um, for as long as they have access to information. And that type of, and it's all linked with the same student level de-identified ident identifier, as well as different like school and also teacher identifiers. So I think different states have different policies. Um, so if you're interested in doing some sort of national um, effort like this, you would see variation in your ability to link um, kids and schools and teachers to each other by that. I'm sure some of that is, is is policy, um, privacy, uh, uh, security, and then some of it is just technological capability, right? I'm sure, um, though, though Massachusetts has a single ID for for students, I'd be shocked if that were the case in the majority. Maybe I'm wrong, but I'd be I'd be surprised. Maybe you've all seen more than I have, but if that was the case in most states, I mean, I imagine that school data is a is a mess of, at the at many levels, um, and so it takes quite a bit of investment even to create that Massachusetts data set, right? So, yeah. Yeah. So it's sort of a, a an interesting use case. Um, yeah. Also, it's an interesting question about the data was not intended to be open initially, and even though it's open now, I mean that was a question during the presentation. What does it mean that it's open, and how open is it? And I don't think that any of this information is easily accessible to parents or even teachers. Uh, you know, to find it, you have to go through, you have to know what you're looking for and go through many different pages. It's kind of hidden, so it's it's not quite open. And you know, it's not as if if parents want to know is bullying an issue at their child's school, they can't go to their their kid's school's website and type that in or even just even use, on just use Python. They'll, right. they'll be fine. Just mm -hmm. Right. I mean so that's why I mean with, at DNA Info in our article we actually created a tool where you could type in your you know, any school and, and see how many incidents were reported to the state, but it's it's really not very open. And I, I've never thought about I mean it's really interesting. I never thought about the the original creation of the data and its original intent and whether it was meant to be public or not as a reason why a lot of this happened. So it's a really interesting point. I've been thinking about this stuff for a while and no one's ever brought that up. So I appreciate you sharing it. I'm wondering if if um, if we think that uh, that leads to, right, the more, the more data that gets out in the public, the more stories can be mistold, the more issues. That's why a lot of uh, frankly, agencies are, don't want to release something because it creates more work for them. Uh, people don't understand what they're looking at. They're going to make some false statement, and then I'm going to have to spend three weeks cleaning it up. Um, you know, there's a lot. There's a lot of that going on. Um, what is your view? I don't know from from 
each of you on 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 open data and its place, and, and do we think that it's a, it's a largely a net positive, or do we think that, that some of the risks that come out might actually outweigh some of the gains? That's a, I guess that's a controversial statement on Open Data Week, celebrating open data, but, I, <laughs> but at least I'm curious at how people sort of fall on that scale and whether they think a lot, whether they, they're anxious about, about open data more than they are uh, opti uh, optimistic, or whether, you know, wh where they fall on that kind of spectrum. I don't know if anyone has thoughts on that. I mean, I'll just say that for this data set in particular, uh, because of the reporting issues, and I, it's likely that schools underreport, um, the data loses some of its meaning to families if they're really trying to figure out what's happening at schools and how schools are handling. I mean, the big question is you want to know, as a parent, you know, how does the school address bullying? And these, you know, the, the data isn't going to tell you that. Right. So. I mean, I guess I would say all of these data sets are being funded with taxpayer dollars. So I think there is some responsibility to to make it open and facilitate it in different ways. Um, you know, I, I think your point is a really good one, how easy this is for sort of parents and students and the folks that are sort of the consumers of uh, the information as opposed to researchers and enforcers. Um, but I do think, I mean, you're right. Technically, legally, any piece of paper that's created by any government agency belongs to you, and you can request it using freedom of information laws. That's not the same thing as it being truly open. As you said, they are locked in PDFs. It takes four months to get them. There, there's all kinds of things redacted. I mean, we deal with this all the time at the ACLU on like massive scales, um, which is why I'm writing a lot of policy to require public reporting. But I think when you're talking about the public not knowing how to or misusing data, or for example, the New York Post, if you to pull have, out of if you increase the quality of the data, the New York Post will write a story that says there have been more incidents. They don't, they're not going to break that down and say, oh, no, actually there's reporting more categories or this is better data. It's not actually more incidents, right? That happens all the time. Um, and I think the reason that that happens is because there is no good data source for the public, for like a regular person who's not a data analyst to say, what is happening in my school? Or for a journalist to go, is this administration better than the last at dealing with bullying? I mean, the government hasn't done its job. So their response is to hide what they their reports, but what they really should be doing is putting out more reports that tell the story they want to tell and say, here's how we got to this number. Here's something you can actually use and work on. And also, here's all the other work we did to put this together. I mean, they really have to do both. And on some degree, they actually technically have to give you everything you ask for. So, And, and it turns out that the my understanding of the New York City open data laws were that they were written to match the same privacy standards as freedom of information requests. Yeah. So in theory, in theory, anything that you could free, well, file right. a FOIL request for should, in theory, be able to be an open data set. At least that was the way the intent of yeah. legislation. I'm, I'm not the lawyer on the, on, the, on the stage here, but that was what I, my understanding was. In that way, when people were able to get it out and they said, we need to make this open, if the response is we can't, you can say, well, you just get it out That's via right. FOIL. That's actually uh, the story of the, how the taxi data <laughs> became public through freedom of information requests uh, that were then kind of came over and became uh, an open data set because if it was good enough for, for one set, it had to, it sort of yeah. passed the legal standard. So, so whose responsibility is it then? Do, I guess you're, you're kind of implying, um, I don't know if others agree, that, that it's really government's responsibility to, to give uh, not only the data, but the, the, like, the proper tools and understanding of that data so that people can make educated decisions. Do we, do we think that's sort of government's role, or, or, or are they the neutral? Like if, they, if you could you could accuse them of trying to spin a story if they, if well they, they have to give you both they right. have to give you the raw data and then they have to give you the something you can use I think you're a consumer of government services so they need to give you something you can use if you're a parent you're a journalist you're a lawyer you're whoever you're using government services so you need to be able to get that information and interpret it but if you're you or most everyone else on this panel except me you would want the raw data, which is also available to you and should be open. I mean, we still have this issue with the NYPD putting PDFs on the open data portal, right? They have like, it's like they just discovered PDF and that's like, they're stuck there, right? I mean, it's crazy, it's crazy. So 
that's a problem. But they also, if they're, you know, leading to a place where they're going, this data is being misused, then that's on them to help tell the story of how it should be properly used, not just hide it and lock it away because they don't trust the public with it. Yeah, and I, and I think progress is being made to their credit. I, we still have a lot of PDFs, but like five years <laughs> so ago, five years ago, they would issue the, every single traffic accident in New York was put in a single PDF file with uh, like 500 pages in a table. Oh, and they published this boy. PDF file, which was a table with, with thousands of rows. And that was their, their and, and some guy wrote something, uh, John Krauss uh, here in New York, wrote something called the NYPD Crash Data Band-Aid that would go to the NYPD website every day, <laughs> look for the PDF. When it found it, it would write a scraper, and he would post a mirror CSV file on his site. Once that started happening, about a year and a half later, they released the CSV file <laughs> on, a, on, a, on an ongoing basis. So, so, so progress is moving in the more open direction, um, and as is, Hey, you know, New York City's celebrating open data with uh, promoting this entire uh, event, and we have uh, uh, people from the mayor's office as well here. So it's uh, it's uh, it's moving, but there's always there's always a lot more to do. I think. Yeah. Yeah, and I guess I would just say one other thing is uh, just considering sort of the the nature of the data itself. Particularly, I was struck as we were talking about um, you know the allegations of bullying and harassment. That data is what I would consider much more squishy data um, in terms of its uh, the way it's reported. Um, even at the federal level, it is. Um, Something that we have received anecdotal feedback that is something not as easy for districts and schools to provide in a standardized way. Um, there are usually folks, coordinators at the district level that spend the bulk of their time um, when it comes to civil rights data collection, which collects a vast amount of information that's mostly administrative. And something like allegations where folks are writing up specific things as they are getting them, and it's not housed in the same central data systems, it's not in student information systems in the same way, makes it a much harder sort of p data piece to pull, tease out, and talk about um, in the same way as some of the other sort of data pieces. And I would also say it's not just providing the data, it's providing the documentation about how you created the data set. So if you look at the New York City School data, you get, again, aggregated means for individual items. And basically you need to know things like how much of this data was missing to create this aggregate. Because that tells you something. That's in itself an indicator of parent engagement based on the parent data. You need to know uh, the scales of the items were scaled on. Because they used to actually be scaled, a uh, one to four scale became a one to 10 scale somehow in the data set. And there's no documentation of that. So all the processes that were used to get the data into usable form is really, really important for actually using the data if you're gonna do the type of analyses like we saw today. Of course, every time you change a survey, you break a data scientist's heart because they can't, <laughs> while you have better data, they can't look at the past anymore and they have to stop and wait again, right? So <laughs> it's a trade off. It's like we want to keep mm -hmm. making everything better, but every time we do, when you switch from that four scale to somewhere, somebody's lost a wing, I think. <laughs> so, something else that I think would help immensely that we run into a lot is the people who are writing these laws don't know data and they don't have data experts on their staff. They don't. And very rarely, <laughs> I would say maybe Gail Brewer is like the big exception, right? Um, there's a few who really get it and are like on it. And the rest were like, look, we need to put out this data on student arrests in schools. And they look at us and go, there's no way to do that and protect student privacy. And we're like, are you kidding me? This is a district of a million students. Like, of course there's a way to do that. Right. I don't know what the way to do that is. And they don't know what the way to do that is because it's a lawyer talking to a lawyer talking to a legislator, but having more data people in the room, we now will do that. We have a data analyst on staff and I'll be like, could you just talk to her and try to get something into this law that makes sense? It's really, really hard from a legislative drafting perspective to write data reporting and public reporting laws in a way that supports what you guys want to do because the legislators just really aren't there. And there's a fascinating, I've always been fascinated by the by the balance between legislative action and executive action in this space. Obviously, we, we, we've seen some of the weaknesses of executive action this year at the federal level, but um, at the same time, when, it, when there's executive action, uh, it feels like the people who are making the data are also doing it for their own, <laughs> for their boss. When it's legislative action, they're doing it because they have to. And so sometimes legislation is like pulling pulling out and sometimes executive is like is yeah. pushing out. But then again, the legislative is more permanent. So I, there's not necessarily a better way to go. New York has been, you know, has largely gone the legislative route where it became, at first it was under the Bloomberg administration, it was very, I, in fact, the, if you look at their talking points before they opened it, it was, it was about, um, we, we want to be user friendly. Uh, and it is not user friendly to give people raw data 
uh, therefore we should not provide raw data. We are all about user usability. And there's nothing usable about raw data. That was the, that was the line out of the Bloomberg administration until the legislation passed. And then it was, hooray, we are the open city, uh, we are celebrating. Um, so sometimes, you know, there's, there's some, there's some dichotomies there. Uh, a question for Jasmine. You created this, uh, uh, awesome resource. Have you either, do you know who uses it? Have you ever approached, uh, the city itself? Hey, would you want to append this to your uh, open data files? Or have you ever had communication of that sort? Um, we haven't approached the city in order for them to append it to their files. We actually just download all the data that they have available and reorganize it in a way that we thought was useful. So we also release it with all the variables that we think are the most useful. And after seeing the presentation and the work that you did, I think it's actually important for us to think about how it might be linked to other data sources, which I don't think we were actually thinking about it oriented in that perspective. Um, so I was actually checking it before this panel, and I realized that there were gaps in particular years. So that could be something that we pay more attention to going forward, making sure that we have all those years filled in so we can have a full crosswalk so that people can use it for stuff. And are you, have you seen like interesting uses of the data, or are you, are you familiar with uh, uh, outside of your own organization? Obviously, I always make something, I say, everyone's going to use it, and then I just use it. <laughs> um, uh, it's bad for everybody. Have you seen other, have you seen uh, 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 any pickup outside, or has it largely been sort of an internal use thus far? Yeah, so we actually collect data on who is downloading the file. Um, if they fill out the information before they download it, then we get to know who they are. Um, and it's largely grad students, I think. There you um, go. You're, 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 driving, you're driving research, right? That's, also, that's, what we, that's good. Yeah, there are also policymakers and educators that are curious to look at the data, and it's structured in such a way that you can open it. Um, you don't need like software to do it and take a look right. at what's in there. So. And those grad students become the later on the policymakers. So the fact that they have it, they'll carry that forward as they go into these into their future uh, future roles. Um, uh, other, I, I have, how about uh, for all of you? I mean, have you seen have you seen uses of this kind of data uh, really drive policy change, um, like uh, either either through the public or through your organizations themselves? Uh, that was that was made possible because of some of the open data. You have, you have instances of that. I mean, there's a lot of like let's release everything, and then there's a so what. Some of that is hey, we can we can write a, a story about it, and I'll actually your version of the question might be did you see any response to that story that 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 came off of it, and to everyone else have you seen tangible results to the release of this sort of data? Here we talked about it, but the so what is always the hard part, right? Well, oh, go ahead. Oh uh, well, interestingly, so. I used 2013, 2014 data as well. And, uh, and at that time, there were, I think, 30% of the city schools reported at least one incident of bullying. And you know, at that time, there had been some concerns. The state controller raised issues about underreporting. The attorney general raised issues about underreporting. Uh, then subsequent to my article, the public advocate raised issues about underreporting and had a public awareness campaign. And I just looked at the 2016-2017 data, and now it's up to 48% of schools are reporting at least one incident. So it does seem to have moved a little bit the needle. And also, when when I wrote my, when I wrote my story, somewhere someone's going to conclude that bullying is on the rise. <laughs> Right. Instead of, uh, right. Instead, of, instead of they've changed the way they record bullying. Right. That's and the challenge of all of this, isn't it? Right. And next year, I mean, there was this incident that uh, at a Bronx high school where um, a, a child stabbed and uh, you know killed another student and uh, said he was a victim of bullying. And so now there's this sort of crackdown on schools to report bullying. So it will be interesting to see what happens moving forward with. The reporting, but uh, but it you know even before that it did seem to m be moving in a different direction and maybe interestingly or maybe not uh, uh, when I wrote my story in the top ten schools they were mostly charters who were reporting higher numbers of bullying incidents and in the most recent data available that flipped and it was mostly public schools and so you know that does seem like there was a directive from the DOE to schools potentially to report more. Or for the charters to report less. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Either way. Um, one thing that we are working on right now is actually a, a requirement that teachers take pre-service credit hours on 
um, cultural competency because that's a huge gap, when, especially when you're talking about discriminatory harassment and bullying or sort of in those kind of protected categories. Um, and in fact, when you're talking about gender and sexuality bullying, most teachers report that they they basically just ignore it or like try to wait for someone else to deal with it because they don't feel like they have the language or the competency to deal with that. Um, and so we're very close to actually getting that done and requiring teachers before they can become certified as teachers in New York to have taken three credit hours on some kind of cultural competency course, um, which would be a huge improvement. And in fact, the state law, which we didn't really talk about today, but the state law, the Dignity for All Students Act, the purpose of that law is to prevent and prohibit conduct, bullying conduct in the schools. And having better trained teachers is a very good way to actually prohibit and prevent, even though it's not something that was required by the law. Um, we, we're sort of heading that direction. I think a lot of it comes from every year these numbers come out and everyone, like schools are embarrassed and the mayors are, and the superintendents are like, what do we do with this? Um, that we can keep that drumbeat going and saying, look, there, there are problems here, whether or not you think the data is reliable, we need to get better at helping kids. And that we're definitely seeing that. There's also been identified um, racial disparities in the reports of bullying and harassment um, across the board, so starting in elementary school, going through high school. And so some of my colleagues at NYU when I was in grad school linked those racial disparities, disparities to differences in academic performance. And I think that really prompted the DOE to make some uh, change. And so there's now a bunch of initiatives directed at primarily racial ethnic minority high schools um, to combat those issues. And I think that information wouldn't have actually really come to light um, without having a firm data source to, to provide evidence for it. Absolutely. I think kind of going back to this question too of what should be released and how it should be aggregated to be released, it's something that we don't even want to deal with, which is part of why we just take data that the DOE has already said is okay to release and just reorganize that. Um, but it's kind of interesting to think like, how could we release data by race, for example, or could we release data by some other um, important category so we can answer more of these questions on an open level? Yes, something that I really want, it's not just the mean, but the standard deviation of the response mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. tell you whether yeah. is that, like, <laughs> does everyone feel that way or just a few people? Because that would be... Is it outlier driven or, yeah? Yeah, that would be really powerful, I think. So think about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm going to uh, open this up to uh, any questions from the audience. If you have a question and, and it's uh, directed at uh, one of our panelists, please you know, direct it that way. If it's a general one, that's OK, too. Um, so if you are interested in asking a question, there's going to be a big spotlight. It's going to come out and no, But you have to come up and use this uh, uh, microphone here to ask the questions uh, So and open it up. I can ask questions all day because this is awesome and we have very talented people to my, uh, to my left. So I'm having a good time, but I want to make sure everyone has a good time. So anyone have any uh, questions for our panelists? Don't all jump at once. And who's this part? Mm -hmm. It's okay, don't be shy. All questions are good questions. So I'm kind of wondering how much of this sort of lack of making the data accessible and you know in some way consumable by our constituents, be it parents or administrator, so do you think is intentional? Because uh, I was trying to think of you know times where maybe that data has been sort of condensed in a way that you know people could use it, and you know we had the whole situation with uh, you know New York City releasing you know, teacher reports in this very you know, easy to digest uh, format, and then just how fiercely opposed, basically, you know, the entire education establishment was either, you know, talking about the methodology it was flawed, and or you know how the ch challenge and challenges inherent in sort of comparing teachers and across schools, uh, and so you know, and I've seen this elsewhere. I lived overseas. Like it seems to me that you know, whenever that data, you know, then gets condensed into something that we're saying something definitive uh, and then people can make choices on, uh, the feelings are almost unanimously kind of very strong sort of against this and maybe trying to invalidate uh, the conclusions in that data set. So I'm, I'm wondering if you think that maybe there's some intentionality behind sort of not producing these kind of very digestible um, reports. 
<laughs> of course there is. I mean, of course, uh, there's no doubt that there is. That's why we ask for raw data sets. I mean, the NYPD wants to tell you one thing about what's happening in your neighborhood, and we want to do the math and tell ourselves what's happening. The, the methodology is legit. Like, those criticisms of the teacher rating system were real. I think from both a, a labor perspective but also from a statistics perspective, they were really problematic. How do you rate an art teacher next to a history teacher? It's a really great question. Um, I have no idea how to do that. So I think there's consume, consumable information that's useful, but absolutely they're putting their thumb on the scale every time they decide to make it more complicated or harder to read or anything like that. We deal with this all the time. You talked about aggregation. We run into this all the time where the NYPD will claim that they need to protect student privacy by aggregating things, but student privacy laws don't apply to the NYPD. And of course, if they want to, they'll go to the New York Post and tell some story about a kid that was really bad and they don't care about their privacy then. But if it comes down to actually like, de you know, disaggregate this data and tell us what you're doing, they won't do it. So I mean, there's all kinds of incentives to tell those kinds of stories. So to build on that, when we started kind of editing these surveys a little bit in 2013 to get more variation in the response, because it was really bad before then, um, I think the people at the DOE like really wanted to get good information. But then when we would introduce question types, these type of like debates would come up like, oh, what's going to happen? So the question about bullying and harassment, it, you were actually, the original question was to report on how many times you were bullied or harassed in the last month. And then that turned into this kind of like broad catch-all question that's really not, and also bullying and harassment we wanted to pull out as two separate things. So people were like, uh, but if we say that, then everyone's going to hone in on the schools where X percent of kids are experiencing this at a higher level, and that's going to make those schools look bad. And so then those kind of things, when you're combining information about like wanting to provide open data, but also the fact that these are like real kids and real teachers in schools who are going to, this may reflect poorly on them, that is kind of where this then watering down happened, I felt. It's amazing, you know, as someone, from, from our point of view, you look at a number and then it's amazing the amount of thought and decision making that goes into the creation of, you know, to you it's a mean. To, to the, you know, 30 people who, and lawyers and this and that, that made it, there's, there's a lot of really careful thinking and seeing some of that uh, valuable insight from inside is, is, is really interesting. Um, it takes you right back to that incentives question, right? Because it's not just about do they feel bad, but actually then do they not report because they don't want to feel bad. They don't want the post to say, here's the schools that have the most bullying last year. Like, right. then they just won't report anything. So then we sort of, even if we create a great data question, we don't get good answers to it. It doesn't serve that purpose either way. Mm -hmm. Right, because it's not as if these schools are going to get guidance, extra guidance right. counselors and extra mental health supports. That does not happen, and so they'll just be scrutinized more. Mm -hmm. And as, uh, you know, because we don't have a, a, a city agency up here today because they you know, aren't here, but, and I, I am someone who's pushed New York City hard to release data, so I, I'm, not, I'm not easy on them, but we, it's also important to recognize that there are, that, that, that is, everything you're saying is absolutely true some of the time. They're not necessarily all the time, right? That, that there are, there, and the, the real struggle from outside of government is to figure out which is the case. That, right? You hear sometimes it's a privacy issue, and you know, obviously when you're an expert you understand everything, you know what is true and what's not. If you're not so much, you just take it for granted, right? Um, so it's either going to be a privacy issue, a security issue, right? Or maybe it's a political issue, and that's where things get, get kind of interesting. Um, but it's hard to know. We can all just assume that everything's political. Um, there is a breakdown, uh, and, and, and where that, where that balance is, is is up for a lot of debate. But um, sometimes there's legitimate uh, uh, issues that come up and make releasing, especially when you talk about student-level data. You know, somebody, I don't remember if it was uh, what, what somebody was, took the New York City taxi data, and I mean, some, there's some interesting things, everything from, I don't know if you remember the celebrity, I don't know, catch a celebrity one, which was basically, they took New York City taxi rides, matched them with pictures of celebrities getting into taxis, and figured out where they were going, and then figured out how much celebrities tipped on the trip. Wow. <laughs> so like, that's a little bit weird, right? Like, wait, that's can that, that, that's public? Is that, that feels a little violating, but is it? Well, open data, because, you know. And then someone else did something which I don't know if it was, this is, this is maybe more of a thought experiment than a, than a piece of academic work, um, so take it with a grain of salt, but um, can you, figure out uh, uh, taxi drivers that stop uh, a certain number of times per day to pray uh, and thus figure out their religion by looking at when the taxi stops at the same time. I, in, and then in certain countries, that's a, you can't, a government can't tell you something about their religion, that's illegal. And so like these things get very, very complex very fast. And even when it seems so obvious, 
Um, and then sometimes when they try to encrypt something like was famous with the New York City taxi data again, they tried to encrypt the, uh, the taxi medallions, but whoever did it, like because there was the, the library of possible outcomes was very small and known, someone was able to reverse engineer it and decrypted it and put all the medallions back and re-release the data, which just of course made government, you know, maybe they're doing a service because they're security loophole, but Next time they release something, it's going to take an extra year because of that. And so it's, it's a tug of war. It's, 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 it's tricky. We're also in that it's similar debate right now is happening over LGBT information about students who identify as LGBTQ. There was a law passed last year in the city that would basically requires any form that re asks you for any demographic information to also ask if you identify as LGBTQ. And we push back really hard on particularly with students because an adult might understand that that is optional, but a kid filling out like their emergency contact form in sixth grade does not. And what is yeah. the secretary trained to say when they see that? Oh, you're gay. I didn't know. Right. Who knows what they're going to say? It, it's just like Feels, it's yeah. so many ways that could go wrong for especially a young person, but really for anyone that's seeking government benefits to make it clear that that was optional was really, but what does that mean? It means we don't know we can't look at the data and say, for example, uh, kids who identify as LGBTQ are much more likely to be arrested or suspended in school. We just don't know that. We're never going to know that. We can know race. We can know a lot of other information. But it, it's really sure. something we grapple with, with privacy. We need data on everything. Then we yeah. can I'll answer all of our questions. Other, other questions in the audience, please. Hi. So a lot of the um, so what's or actionable items that you suggested came from the top down, but a lot of times the most effective change comes from the local level. So how can you empower schools to act on this data? I mean, reports are, are great, but as a former teacher, I know these get lost. You have teachers who aren't data literate, school leaders who aren't data literate, but also just a lot of noise coming in, um, a lot of reports, uh, a lot of data. And so how do you, yeah, how do you um, empower to, the, the local level to act on this? So on the prevent and prohibit conduct lens, we're thinking about the intent of the laws to prevent and prohibit bullying conduct. What we did when we wrote that law was actually put out guidance to schools about vendors they could work with and also free resources to create real-time data collection. So they're actually looking at their data every day. That would be the ideal because then you're looking at patterns and saying things like we worked with a school where they said, oh, well, it seems like the kids, all the incidents are happening at 2 o'clock, whatever it was. Well the kids are going crazy at two o'clock because they're ready to get out of here. So now we did a stand up and stretch break, which sounds overly simple, but we're talking about third graders. It is simple, right? But without that real time data, they never would have seen that pattern. And unfortunately, that's not how most of it is collected. Most of it is like, oh, I got to send in this report. They're not ever doing that extra step of like, well, if I have to do this report, let me see how I can use it in the school. And um, there's no requirement to use it that way. So we try to get those resources out to schools, but it's absolutely important. It's funny. Um, as a parallel, uh, so I work with the, the data clinic here, and we, we, we work with nonprofits and do sort of pro bono data science work. And some of the early conversations a lot of people have is all about reporting. In a similar way, they have, a, they have a, uh, a, some sort of grantee that requires them to show that they're having an effect. And often they come to us and say, can you measure how we're doing so we can get more money? And we're like, yeah, but what about making, your, making your, uh, what you do better? Right, so a lot of the data from a reporting, a lot of times it's reporting, and I still think people are still very early, whether you're a government agency, a school, or or a nonprofit, that that to get to take a step back and say, just because I have to report this out doesn't mean it's not useful, <laughs> and I can do something internally too. So yeah. Yeah, and like in the ed education space, just getting to the point that you're a, te uh, a former teacher, um, there's this new movement called Research Practice Partnerships. I think the Research Alliance is really like an example of this. But the idea is that researchers shouldn't just be like basically taking all this open data and using it for their own purposes, which may be like academic journal articles or, you know, if you're an academic to get tenure, but you really should be working with districts, working with schools to help them interpret the data and identify how they can use it to make decisions, while at the same time training people that most of this is correlational data. It doesn't necessarily say, like, we found this regression coefficient, so you should do this and X will happen. So kind of making people more data literate about, literate about what's descriptive versus what's really causal, I think is also a component of that. And I think it's going to take a while to get to a point where researchers are really helping districts and schools in a meaningful way. But I think that at least right now, there's definitely a fervor for that. And there's a lot of federal funding available and foundation funding to do that. So these are alliances where, you're, where, where local governments are part of the alliance with 
with these organizations? Is that the yeah? So the model? for for example, the Universal Pre K movement and um, well, the Universal Pre K policy in New York City. Um, the de Blasio administration has a research practice partnership with NYU researchers who are working with them on the ground to kind of, basically it sounds like they're like texting back and forth on a regular basis to make decisions in real time and use data to make decisions. So I know I've seen that as an example. And I think uh, that is a really good example of sort of the feedback loop um, can also do a lot to improve data quality, which is a big piece. So if teachers understood what the data could be used for, there would be more buy-in to report it in the right way. And uh, yeah, I, I think it's all about those incentives. Mm -hmm. And also the reporting itself. I mean, a lot of schools probably have archaic infrastructure to make it difficult to report. And you know, we all know that teachers are really busy, administrators are really busy running the schools and trying to create the culture that cuts down on the bullying itself. So you know, the time it takes to report the incident, I mean, it's, it is not negligible necessarily. And so you know, there are so many other bureaucratic things that schools have to deal with that another reporting yeah. mechanism isn't always welcome, so, so I don't have an answer, actually. <laughs> Often new, new reporting requirements don't necessarily come with budget increases. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, that's a sort of a government famous thing that the, the legislation passes. Usually, a lot of times, unfunded. So these unfunded mandates, and so there you are, and you have to fill out now 6,000 forms, but with what extra people? Something's got to give, and that, that explains some of the probably shoddy data work as well. Yeah, I think in our experience also, um, working with organizations actually and sharing the data and letting them know like this is what we can do with your data based on how it is now like let's try to improve that is definitely a good motivator yeah I, I mean I think particularly when we were looking at some of those outliers I was thinking gosh you know like I want to see who that yeah. school with the 26 right. incidents but zero on any of the surveys I mean probably a data reporting error, you know, I, and I just feel like a lot of times, uh, many of the CRDC, uh, there is a process for correcting data, um, and that often happens when reporters write about it, and it's wrong. Yeah, and I, I felt, you know, as, as I, I've worked with some agencies over time to, to find some issues, and I always felt that the only way I could give back and help the city was via a news article, <laughs> which feels very backwards because there were no, there's no openings. There's no, there's not like someone saying, like, oh, here, come talk to me. You found this problem. Let's, let's work through it unless it's, unless it's published in a news article and all of a sudden people want to fix it, which is, which is broken. It's an adversarial relationship instead of a partnership, right? Mm -hmm. um, and open data shouldn't be adversarial. I think if we, if we, if we build up these models that you guys are discussing, maybe it opens up a future where, where this sort of feedback loop, you know, inspires more, more releases. I think someone else, yeah, please. I have, a, I have a question that's uh, kind of more, a bit more uh, product driven, I suppose. Um, so I heard a note on the panel that um, that there's this, there was someone had this idea. I don't remember who, but that um, the same organizations which publish the data should like kind of dog food it in the sense that they should be uh, also be building products based on those on those on those data sets and kind of helping to make them accessible to more people, kind of out in the open because you know government, you know, you, the government serves the average citizen, so the average citizen should have access to the data, and in, have, it should have should be able to use the data in an accessible way, not just look at it like a CSV file. And I'm, what I'm curious about is uh, what are kind of what are kind of the perspectives on the panel about the precise relationship between um, kind of uh, times when this should, ought to be done internally. So within the organizations, the organizations themselves should be putting together the dashboards and the panels and the displays and the analyses of these data sets, which tell you t tell the public interesting things. And how often the onus of this work should be like on, on industry or on public interest groups or on like other people that kind of like are being going through the data and, and like trying to find interesting insights in it. And the reason I ask this question in particular is, is because um, I think that there's kind of um, this is a space where, where we're improving and New York City is a leader in this, but there's still kind of a limit to how much civic technology really goes on within governments. And data, the, the rate at which open data is being published kind of outstrips the rate at which analysis can be done internally. So I'm kind of curious what you, what do you guys think about like the balance of incentives there between you know public and private industry? Mm -hmm. So I can speak to the, oh, you have, 
thought. No, wait, go ahead. I can speak to this. So I work on a lot of federal contracts and now, uh, or grants from the federal government. And now the law basically is if you have one of these federal contracts or grants and you're collecting data, you have to make the data publicly available at the end of the contract period. Um, and basically, one problem is that the budget that is typically allocated does not does not allow for much of this internal work. But I think the ideal would be if that's going to be the policy, then X amount of money is going to be allocated for us to actually do a good job at putting together a restricted access file or a public use file. And in addition to just releasing the data, documentation, not just on how every variable was created, but also what are the means, what are the missing, what does the missingness look like, what's the standard deviation. So when you actually rerun the data, you're reproducing what has already been done, and you don't actually have to do that kind of boring data cleaning processing stuff. You can kind of move on to what you're interested in specifically. So I do think that the people who know the data best are the ones who collect it, initially process and clean it. So the onus really should be on them to put it in this usable format and this format that speaks to this broader audience. The problem is that typically funding time and desire is not part of that. But if you're going to legislate it and you provide the funding, then that would, that would make an improvement in this situation. Um, but I also think then that there are so many questions and so many cuts to the data and so many things that you can do once the data are publicly available that you can't expect the person putting the data set together to kind of consider what all those possible options would be. And that's what makes it fun and interesting to provide the data um, in this open platform. So I think it's a combination of two things from my perspective. But the main thing I'm, more, I'm concerned about is just getting the money to actually be able to put it in this usable format. And if that was available, it would really change, I think, the whole, the whole game. And otherwise, it becomes sort of a blocker where an agency says, I can't release it because I can't build a dashboard. And yeah. so, and you're like, just post a CSV. They say, no, I can't, because I, I, I have to make a dashboard and we don't have the resources. So then the data never makes it out. So it's a, it's a yeah, to your point, it's a balancing act. Yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah, we'll do the last question and then we're, we'll, we'll wrap up. Uh, I was uh, thinking about uh, the disparity between where in some schools 30% of students would feel there is bullying going on all the time but those schools report zero incidents. How much of this could be attributed to students not feeling safe enough or encouraged to actually report bullying incidents to the school administration, and then the administration does not feel kind of obligated to follow through on that? And uh, what can be done or what is done to make sure students do feel safe to report these kind of incidents to the administration? Are there any kind of technical tools online or some anonymous phone apps that allow students to do that, or uh, is going to the school administration and just talking face-to-face -face is the only means kind of currently used in schools, in public schools at least. Thank you. So every school under New York State law is required to have a coordinator in the school that's meant to be someone who's accessible to kids to come and report to. Um, we did a survey last year that was led by, it was a participatory research study by teenagers that we're working with, and they found that fewer uh, than one in nine of their classmates could identify the, who that person was. So it was completely failing, mm. definitionally, what it was supposed to be, which is someone that's accessible to kids. Um, and they're supposed to publish the name online, and they it's really kind of a mess. So we're working a lot on that, but I know the city is launching an anonymous reporting portal I'm not sure what they're going to do when they get those reports, other than the DOE central office is going to call the principal and say, did you know this was happening and are you doing anything about it? Which might just immediately break the confidentiality because so the kid maybe is not really protected. So it's a really good question. But I do think having like a trusted adult in the school who has identified open door policy kind of, you know, come talk to me. And it was really important that that be someone who has enough authority in the school to do something about it and that the principal wasn't just going like, oh, like you're the gay teacher. Can you take care of this? Which we know happens all the time. Um, so that they identify someone who has some power but is also accessible and they just really have kind of failed to do that well. And also I would say that different principals sort of take upon themselves, you know, they create their culture in their schools and some principals do a really good job there is this, you know, no, play, no place for hate initiative, and so a lot of schools will have programming around that, and they'll have special assemblies and things like that. And I wrote a story once about um, Staten Island Tech, which is one of the specialized schools. They actually created, the students created this um, button that, or 
this thing on their website where you could report bullying anonymously. So, you know, and they were uh, recognized by the DOE for having done that. Um, so, you know, I think that there are schools that are doing in interesting and intensive work around creating a, a culture that's that feels safe to students. Um, I will say with that, with that school in Staten Island, it turned out that a lot of the students were reporting feeling stressed as opposed to bullying incidents. And then, but they used that information and, and created a whole new homework policy. Um, but but it was interesting that it it turned out that stress was a bigger problem than bullying. So. Well, uh, can I uh, can we thank our panelists today? That was pretty.